Today, I've had the great opportunity of interviewing Spike Wilner, a great jazz pianist and a jazz club owner of one of the best clubs in the world, Smalls Jazz Club. So, without further ado, let's get to the videos. I have the great opportunity today uh, to interview the great jazz pianist and co-owner of Smalls Jazz Club, Spike Wilner. Um, and Spike, for the people who are unfamiliar with your background, could you give us a little bit about your personal experience as a jazz musician growing up in New York City? Uh, uh, my personal experience was that uh, yeah, I, at age uh, 19 I went to the New School uh, jazz program okay. and I was in that very first class there, the very first class under Arnie Lawrence. And, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, 1986 and there was okay. some, you know, the first class and the first few years had all the uh, very great musicians that have still, you know, my friends to this day and also, you know, making a big impact on the scene like uh, Peter Bernstein, Larry Goldings, sure. Brad yeah. Meldow, uh, Sam Yehel, um Jesse Davis, Roy Hargrove, great. Um, yeah. Joe Strasser, you know, countless guys went through that thing. Um, and But uh, what was more important than that was that I also had a chance to uh, have some amazing piano teachers. Uh, for example, Walter Davis Jr. was my first uh, piano teacher at age 19. Yeah, and, that's, uh, that's great, you know, that you opened had that my mind up quite a bit. Um, you know, it seems like you had a great opportunity to study with some really heavy cats. Um, do I you have, have any great stories to tell about that, like, um, in particular? that? Um, well, I had a lot of, uh, all my teachers have been amazing. Uh, Walter Davis took me in when I didn't know anything about jazz at all, and uh, just you know, opened me up to the world of the culture of the music. He, you know, he talked about Bud Powell and Charlie Parker and Thelonious Monk, people he knew personally, and Art Blakey, and just told me, uh, you know, just, he showed me, of course, lots on the piano, but also sure. more than that enriched me in the legacy of this music and, and the culture of New York, too, the bebop culture and uh, just uh, amazing stories. And uh, I also had the opportunity to stay with Jackie Bayard, same nice, time, nice. Yeah. who uh, opened me up to you know my passion for stride piano and uh, Art Tatum and and also his of course his avant-garde side. So that that was a big influence on me. A man that could be on had the tradition so deep sure, in his yeah, music and also yeah. so creative and uh, forward-thinking. Yeah, and, it seems uh, you, you got an opportunity to really learn um, with a mentorship, mentorship kind of uh, um, take on things instead of like the whole school system nowadays where it's kind of you're learning from a teacher in the school system kind of learning a uh, specific set of things that they want you to to hear um right well you know the first year of the new school was like the way the first few years went down it was just about 35 students and it was always a uh, kind of an open forum arnie lawrence that's great, had us yeah. all together in one room and he would bring in you know, Donald Byrd or, or uh, Jimmy Heath or Jim Hall or some great master Ooh, yeah. and just have us play with him, Jimmy Cobb. We would play with Jimmy Cobb for hours and the experience of just really interacting with these guys and playing with them was really kind of, was kind of heavy. And then also just, of course, being around your peers who were very uh, talented and intense really made you focus on the music. Yeah, sure. So, um, as what's your personal take about um, jazz school back then as opposed to school nowadays and, and what's going on with the the current school scene well um i think jazz school is is a bad idea you know yeah, because sure. uh it's not a it's not an art form that can be taught in a formal uh education way it's i mean you can talk about harmony, which everyone does. Yeah. That's what ends up happening. It gets top heavy on harmony because that's the stuff you can assign. But there's no real way to communicate jazz in a formal setting. You're either going to get it or you won't. And it's kind of like the yeah. way jazz is really taught is it's transmitted from teacher to student uh, in a in a way of just kind of the attitude and feeling of the music. And I think what happens is that the feeling gets very vague when it gets into the institutionalized stuff and so what happens is you have yeah. jazz schools churning out you know t dozens of guys who are shelling out a lot of money yeah. and coming out of it with not even the, the much practical experience like like I think it would be much better to have a conservatory that was a combination of jazz and classical together where you had 
a very sure. formal European style musical training, which involved ear training, intensive ear training, reading, orchestral playing, classical playing, as well as jazz improvisational skills transcribing. Because, yeah, I can't say that I can. I mean, I think yeah. there's some very yeah. good jazz teachers. Sure, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of great teachers. Um, back in the days, um, what you were mentioning really happened because, you know, cats like Miles Davis and uh, Ron Carter, uh, Miles went to Juilliard for classical, Ron went to Manhattan for classical, and back in those days they didn't even encourage learning jazz in the schools, but those cats were able to learn the bandstand and, and learn classicals. And there was the a schools, lot of opportunity you know? to play. I mean, even when I was like, you know, 19, 20, 21, there was quite a bit of opportunity to play in New York City. There was, you know, dozens of clubs open at that time and jam sessions all over the place. And you could always find a gig. I mean, I, I always had a gig because I was always digging around, me and my buddies, you know, Grant Stewart or... Sure, yeah. We would just go out and find gigs at restaurants and bars and play around. And then there was, yeah. of course, the club scene and... and uh, Augie's, which is the place where everyone gathered, or the village gate where everyone gathered. So it was like this community was very strong at that time. The community still exists now. I mean, that's why Smalls yeah. is so important yeah. for me because I want to maintain that community and also the educational part of the community, which is learning how to play by being sure. around people who yeah. play. Yeah, Smalls, um, I actually just heard on the radio, Roy Hargrove was mentioning, you know, Smalls and Fat Cat are one of the last places where cats can really learn something. Uh -huh. And um, now I'd like to take us to Smalls and okay. I, I wanted to ask um, how you came to Smalls and, and how um, you eventually became, you're now a co-owner of Smalls and one of the greatest jazz clubs in New York, if not the world. So uh, I'd just like to ask you um, how you kind of got involved with Smalls. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I've been a professional jazz pianist since I was 19 years old. Sure. And uh, I started playing at Smalls in 1994 when it opened by Mitch Borden. Everybody knows Mitch. Yeah, yeah. And Mitch is a guy that is an unsung hero on the jazz scene, but he really created this environment and created the culture of the environment by allowing it to happen in a way he didn't think about money, he didn't think about profits, he just yeah. thought about creating an environment and letting it grow and grow and giving back. And that spirit that he had infused everything in the club and Great. everyone yeah. keys into it. And for me, I was always very inspired by that kind of thinking. So I, I was very inspired by Mitch to think like him and to, to be like that, to, to think about how you can make a community and how you can make things that are valuable without necessarily worrying about uh, making money. Um, Economics, yeah. And I used to play at Smalls. I mean, I played at Smalls. I had my steady gig from 94 all the way to the time the club closed, which was in 2002. Sure. And then, uh, in you know, my, the club went bankrupt because yeah. the original model for Smalls was just a cover charge and nothing was sold. There was no beer or anything. Yeah. If you brought your own beer, you brought your own booze, but there was nothing sold. And as expenses mounted, the, it became possible to maintain that, that original uh, idea. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, when small, after Smalls closed, another guy got hold of the space uh, and tried to make it into kind of a Brazilian bar, which didn't work. And then yeah. he contacted Mitch and said, hey, let's reopen Smalls. You'll manage it. I'll own it. And that ran for a little bit. And then after a while, that guy got really tired of it because he didn't really understand what it was. And yeah. he didn't understand yeah. what yeah. he had. And he mentioned to Mitch that he wanted to sell the business. And that's when I became involved. Uh, that was in 2007. And sure. uh, I yeah. mortgaged my apartment. and had a partner and uh, we uh, we bought the business and made Mitch full partner again and uh, now uh, actually as of April I'm the sole proprietor. That's great you know it, it seems like you took a um, a huge risk but at the same time it really paid off and, and now... Um, Everybody says yeah, that but the truth of the matter is the, the, the main reason why I got involved with trying to take over Smalls was so that I could keep playing. Yeah, Honestly, like yeah. I didn't want to lose my gig and I still play here so that, that's been always been my main reason and then... Sure. The importance for me is to see musicians playing jazz in New York City and that and being out late, like that that culture of just late nights, yeah. jam sessions, older jazz musicians, young guys who are trying out their stuff, all style ranges. I just want to kind of keep that going, but I also think about myself as an artist and trying to keep my own music going. Yeah, it's great that you have um, a unique opportunity to to have a place where you can call your home base, and I, I guess that happened. Um, towards the end of the 60s and into the 80s with a loft scene, the jazz loft scene. So, um, I guess... Well, the best jazz clubs have always been 
from uh, you know guys who are either been musicians or guys that are been passionately involved in the music. Like you know, the, everyone talks about the Village Vanguard as the legendary yeah. place that it is. And what made the Vanguard so great was Max Gordon because he sure. had yeah. this personal relationship with all these musicians, with Mingus, you know, with Sonny Rollins, with Dexter Gordon, and they they loved him and came in, you know. So based on his goodwill, same thing for the Village Gate with Art Lugoff, you know, and. Uh, you know, the Cafe Society with Barney Joseph, which was just around the corner from here, you know, and, and yeah. the idea of the club can be, I mean, for me, I have a different take on it altogether because I don't even think about it like a club. I I have a kind of a religious vibe to it. Like, I think we're in a monastery. Like, yeah, I, I think yeah. about, like, Smalls is like the monastery and all the musicians are the monks and they come to pray, play, you know, and like we have our ritual. And we have our hierarchy of master yep. monks and acolytes, and I happen to be the abbot. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm the highest level monk, it just means yep. that I'm the administrator. So I have to do that, but I also have to have enough knowledge. And I think what happens with Smalls is that uh, because of the goodwill that Mitch created, and because I think I, I like to think that musicians know me and trust that I'm trying to yep. do the right thing for everybody, uh, that we, we have a, you know, a thing that works through communication yep. with the artists and and everyone that comes in knows that that you know it's it's a spiritual event down here it's not a business event and that being said i am trying my best to make it more of a business thing not in the sense of trying yeah. to make more more money for me but more money for the club so that the artists can be rewarded and everybody can be rewarded sure. there's no reason yeah. why we can't do that well wow that's a really great analogy um, with the the monastery cuz uh, it feels that way this is certainly a special place um, could you speak to us uh, on your current uh, take with the steady stream of jazz school students who do come to Smalls with the sessions and, and such? Um, what do you think about how they dress and are they really knowledgeable about the, the music and, and what sorts the poor ones from the great ones? Well, you know, uh, Smalls is like a, and all, you know, the real jazz music for that matter, I mean, I can only talk about jazz because that's my expertise, it's, it's, it's yeah. a filtration system, you know, and the way it's filtered is through each other. You know, like, yeah. everyone that studies the music knows what's good and what's, who's good, who's bad, but you can, you can tell. Yeah. So what happens is you get treated accordingly. And even if you think you're really, really good, if the other musicians don't really consider that to be, you know, you can be screaming at the top of your lungs until you can actually say, here's my shit, yeah. here's my yeah. shit. No one's going to pay attention to you, but also people grow. So, over if you study and apply yourself, you can grow. And and everyone's always willing to allow someone to grow. That's how musicians are. Musicians are very open to to great music. Sure, so if someone's yeah. really dealing, everyone gives them up. Uh, you know, one guy asked me once. Uh, I won't say who it is, but a musician came up and said, you know, how do I get a gig at Smalls? And I said, well, there's three ways to get a gig at Smalls. The first would be if you're just a genius, you know, if you're like, yeah. if you're Bird, you know, you're Art Tatum, you come to Smalls, everyone knows you're a genius, every musician that hears you thinks you're a genius, Yeah, you can play as Smalls as much as you want, and you will. Uh, the second way is if you come in as a sideman with someone that's already playing at the club, established, you know, and yeah. I love seeing that, I love it, like, for example, Ari Honig might hire some young musician that he heard yeah. hanging out and bring it into his band and so all of a sudden everyone has a ten and you know then he, that young guy starts doing well yeah. and that's yeah. the natural order to be to have a, a, a an older musician established one recognize you and bring you in yeah yeah and then the third way getting a gig is it, it's just to hang out man i tell people you know like i'm glad you have a great cd and all but just come come here hang out if, yeah. you know the guys that, that hang out at smalls every night and play and contribute they're, they're the ones that work here and it's that simple i don't know it's not really rocket science it's just like and and the guys that can hang tough yeah and because they have the passion for it are the ones that will make it you know and, sure. and there's yeah. young guys coming out of the jazz schools if you ask like man you know i i can say for example spencer murphy who works here at the club who also yeah. works with one of my Great managers baseball. now is a young bass player and, and has really developed, he's really become a beautiful player and he's also been very, very stalwart and just hanging. And there's a lot of guys yeah. like that. Ken and Ben Ken Fowler and Bengalese came from SUNY Purchase. Yeah. Someone like yourself who who I've seen already now a couple of years on the scene hanging tough. You yeah. know, to me, those are the guys that are going to you know, because they're working on their stuff, they're serious and they're they're on the scene 
and getting heard so that people can say, oh shit, I need a bass player. Oh man, you know that Cat Jonah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. you know, instead, if you're at home shedding all the time or you're just mailing CDs, I mean, I get 200 CDs a week. I can't listen to them. I, and I don't listen to them either. I, do, I really don't. I mean, I don't want to insult anyone, but it's like, if I have time to put on some music, I'm going to listen to probably some, you some know. Some live music. <laughs> well, I hear yeah. that all the time, but, you yeah. know, probably some, I don't know what, man. Probably just put on the Sonny Rollins or something, to be honest. Well, yeah, it's really, um, you know, speaking of the, the whole live situation, uh, it's really great that you guys uh, stream live video of everything yeah. that goes on as small as I, I don't think I've ever seen another jazz club around the world that does that. And, um, you know, do you think that that has an influence in how the people play at the club? Um, That's an interesting question. Um, at first, I think they did. And now I think no one thinks about it that much because it's just so regular. Like, we've been streaming live now for four years. Yeah. Um, what... We are going to do though is that we're going to have to uh, utilize that website to help the club, and this is something that I've been planning a long time. Um, but I think what's happened is we've achieved a, a high level of popularity with that site, with people checking yeah. out the archive and also the live web stream. And um, you know, one of the things that's happened to Smalls in the last month or two is that uh, we've signed a new lease on the club. So I signed a new yeah. lease, which is going to give us ten more years. Great. But it's yeah. going at a 35% a increase right off the bat, up yeah. to 50%. And so, you know, we're in a bind at Smalls because we only have 60 seats in the club. Our cover charge is 20 bucks. Our yeah. drink prices are what they are. And where does the additional revenue come as expenses mount? And, and the, the, you know, we can't raise our cover charge. I mean, what am I going to do, charge $30 to get into Smalls? It's yeah. not going to work. Yeah. You know, or raise my drink prices. So I think the answer is going to be a membership basis for the website. That sounds like a, a great uh, opportunity for some revenue for Smalls as well as a, a great uh, way for people to give back to such a great... Uh, well, I think the way, to, 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 the way I'd like to present it is, is that uh, I'm going to take the time in the next half a year to first of all upgrade the web stream so that the quality is much better video and audio. And yeah. once, once the platform is much more stable and looks good, I think what we're going to do is, is try to present it to people like a membership the way that you would join an art society yeah. uh, where the statement of where, where your membership fee will go to. And first of all, I think what we're going to, in the tradition of smalls, charge a very nominal fee. It would probably be $10 a year for a basic sure. membership, which will allow you to watch unlimited video on the stream. And, and all the audio archival stuff will stay free anyway. Um, yeah. And then people, it'll have multi-tier so that people can give more if they want with the understanding that your membership to Smalls, Smalls Live, will A, supplement the cost of the club, yeah. B, go to the salaries of the musicians so that uh, we can pay a more competitive wage to the artists that play here, yeah. and third, uh, I'd like to start a foundation that's going to be a chari charitable foundation. Um, which I'm going to dedicate in the memory of Harry Whitaker. I'm going to call it the Harry Whitaker Foundation, and it's going to be an emergency financial fund for musicians in need. If they, someone like Harry is stuck for bread, or sure. some great yeah. musician that we know, like the Jazz Foundation does it already, and they're a great, great organization. But I think ours will be more, more personal because it'll be for musicians That's who great. play at yeah. Smalls can qualify. And I think by presenting that to people, there's a lot of goodwill, and like you said, a lot of people want to support this sure. place, and so. That may be our answer to how we can survive into the next 10 years because I, yeah. otherwise we really don't have a lot of opportunity to grow financially and that's going to be a big problem in the yeah. next year or two. Um, for people who don't know um, so much about Harry Whitaker, could you speak to, to who he is and how important he was to Smalls and the, the whole family of the, the jazz world? Yeah, Harry Whitaker was a jazz pianist from Detroit and uh, he had a, a great career, played with Roberta Flack as her musical director and Roy Ayers, and uh, wrote a lot of, you know, kind of was on the fusion scene in the 70s, and Miles Davis knew about him, and then yeah. he kind of became part of the local scene in New York and, and became a teacher and mentor to a lot of people, including myself, who I met Harry when I was about 25 yeah. or something, and he became a very beloved friend and also teacher for me, it really taught me more than nearly any of my teachers, um, but he also had uh, health issues, high blood pressure, and, and yeah. some emotional issues that debilitated him. And uh, because he had no insurance and because he had no money, he really suffered at the end of his life. And uh, yeah. there was not much help for him. And so for me, 
what I'd like to try to do is if we can really generate revenue from the site, I'd like to make sure that a, a significant portion of that goes to a fund where I can use that money to help other musicians that might be in a similar position. That's really great. That's uh, It sounds like a, a really unique opportunity to uh, benefit back the I musicians. Think so. the I think so. I mean, I really think that if you do something for the sake of others, man, it can succeed. It's, it, there's no reason to get greedy. You know, there's no reason. I mean, money is, you know, for me, it's like, I'll tell you honestly, like, I... Even if everything tomorrow everything was you know was gone, uh, I could still sit to the piano and, and play. You know, yeah. like for me, playing is the shit. It's always going to be the shit. And and as I get older, it becomes so much more. Just getting to the piano, playing gigs, I, you know, playing with great musicians, listening to music. Uh, that you know, it's like that's my reward. I don't need to have a, a big house or a fancy car clothes or anything like I'm glad as long as I can just you know make things happen but I think that you can focus on doing it for a lot of folks simultaneously and it can it can create an impact you know and that's kind of what I'd like to see happen with small is just create a literally a world revolution of artists you know kind of getting real infusing the world with love and God and letting people remember that there's still like some real shit in this earth that's not like fake corporate bullshit or war or yeah. killing people or all the stupid shit that we constantly see every day. Yeah. You know, it's like jazz is, is the music of the spirit, inner spirit, and you have to be in touch with yourself as a spiritual person to play it correctly. You know, and the blues and swing and New York and that feeling, that's, that is very important stuff and people try to put it away, they try to forget about it, they try to talk about some other shit, but you know what, when it comes right down to it, that's the real shit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, thank you so much for being so true to to what's really going on and, uh, and what's happening here at Smalls. Um, just before we, we finish up, um, this is a, a huge issue that I, I'd like to hear your take as a musician and then as a club owner. Okay. Um, nowadays, a lot of musicians are playing jazz for free uh -huh. um, or for very, very little money. And, uh, you know, tips or just a meal. And, and, and as a musician, what's your opinion on why this is happening? And what do you think could be done to improve the situation? Well, uh... I think traditionally jazz musicians have always played for little money, sure. even the greatest guys. So I mean, not not that that's an excuse, but I mean, there's art, and art is like religion. It's like going to church and praying. It's like you don't yeah. go to church to pray so you can get paid. Yeah. You know. So jazz, playing jazz, like improvising on tunes with a band or playing your own music, that's just such a rare privilege, privilege that playing itself should be enough. Yeah. And if you're a band leader, it's like, you know, if you're a painter, you have to go buy your canvases and your oils and, and paint. You can't just like expect someone to buy your canvases for you so you can make your great art. Yeah. Same thing with music, man. You gotta go out there and maybe shell out some bread out of your own pocket to make your band work. Studio doing commercial takes one after one. Yeah, there should be, that's a job. You should sure. be paid. You know, you know, if you have a skill, you can read something unbelievable and put it down or edit some shit or whatever. It's like, yeah. And I'm not saying that a jazz musician shouldn't get paid because I don't want to get a thousand people sending me negative emails because believe me, I make sure everybody gets paid and I feel you should be paid. But I yeah. think there also should be a level of like, you know, clubs have a hard thing because it's people think every all these clubs are making all this money, you know, and and the truth is it's it's just not necessarily the case. It's expensive. You know, <laughs> it's expensive to run a business, and you know, you know, like for some reason, like for example, the Blue Note has become like the the dark, evil club. I don't know why it's got this reputation of being evil, or you know, if you say the Blue Note, everyone's like, oh wow, you know. But yeah. to me, it's like. The Blue Note is still presenting music, and the guys that play at the Blue Note make good money, you know? So it's like, why is everybody bitching about the Blue Note, you know? But I think that, like, young artists, and I say the word artists, should not be concerned with making money. Now, yeah. how they make their living, that's up to them. I don't know. Maybe from playing, maybe from teaching, maybe from flipping burgers, maybe from, you know, I don't know what you do. You know, like, for me, since I was 19, I've made my living in music, somehow. Playing in restaurants, playing gigs, going on the road, teaching piano lessons to kids, uh, working in music schools, going to hotels out of town and playing for months at a time. You know, it, you do what you gotta do. Yeah. You do what you gotta do, but you keep intact in your mind the art. 
because if you're not involved as an artist first, you might as well just quit and go home because it's not worth it. You know? Amen. You know, uh, thank you. So, uh, thanks so much for taking your time to speak with us. Sure, um, man. And, and please let people know the best way to check out Smalls. Um, SmallsJazzClub.com. Go right on our website. Sure. And, and SmallsLive.com is our record company. And how can they check out your, your music? Uh, I have a few CDs out. I, I just put one out on Smalls Live, which is our label, which is a solo piano record. And then. Could you speak to that label real quick um, and, and how that came about? Yeah, Smalls Live is uh, it's an extension of kind of, I got the idea from the archive that we do because we record all the gigs, you know, kind of in a low quality MP3 style yep. just to reference them so that they're not lost. But uh, I decided to create a label where I would take uh, artists that, that I felt were, you know, important for the generation and had something to say and book them for a couple nights and bring in some engineers and get a really high quality recording of them and let the artist choose the music and just put it out like live jazz yeah. you know just like here it is smalls live and that's that's what it's been we got about 20 titles in the catalog we've got some amazing projects and we got some amazing ones about to come out including like you know we've got all the really some of the top names in this field wonderful recording and and putting it putting records out on our label and uh we're not making any money on it, which is fine. You know, it's the same philosophy. It's like you put it out so that people can hear it. And you know, it's like kamikaze, man. You want to fly your plane into the ship and blow up. You know, it's like yeah. you can't wait to see what's going to happen after that. You know. Well, well, thank you so much, Spike. And uh, you know, uh, I hope that uh, I wish you many years of success. Same to you, man. Yeah. And, and well, you too. I want you back career. playing, man. You know. Yeah.